morning, everyone. Welcome to Freedom's Light, Church of God. We are glad that uh, everybody is with us, even if they're not here in person. Hopefully you're all watching online. Again, I have been called up, drafted into commission to uh, deliver the message today. Y'all won't let anybody else speak, apparently. So Paul had to do it, too. He, I had, had to have somebody else fall on the sword with me. But we're glad to have y'all that are, that are here. We're glad to have y'all that are watching. Uh, everybody who was sick is now better, including Audrey and Alan, praise the Lord. So, uh, and John and Barb are also doing great, and I, they'll probably be back next week. They went hiking. Uh, they did go hiking. So obviously, he's no longer, <laughs> no longer sick. So that's, uh, that's great. And uh, because of that, services will resume as normal next week, praise the Lord. And Paul and I will not have to have to step in to some mighty big shoes to fill so all right so join us for discipleship training it's going to be every t uh, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, Pastor Leah is teaching on I am who I say I am and then Wednesday nights will also recommence uh, 7 p.m. every Wednesday night uh, for Bible study uh, Pastor Jeff has been in Isaiah 53 for probably four or five weeks and he's going to be there for probably another three or four weeks but it's really really good stuff it's all about understanding exactly what Christ's sacrifice did for us. And then also joy bells uh, for the girls at 7 p.m. Hopefully, eventually, one day we'll have uh, boys <laughs> that, will, that will be able to have their own thing on Wednesday nights. But we don't have any little boys around, so uh, only little girls, which would be, maybe that'll be enticing to some little boys. They'll be like, hey, girls. Nah, they hate him at that age. Yeah, no joke. No joke. <laughs> Strike that. Moving right along. With Jesus. Moving right along. Then uh, don't forget preppers. Uh, the next one will be on August 27th. Uh, it's always on the second and fourth Thursday. Obviously, we had some issues with this month, but uh, thankfully we're going to get back on track. And it's on Thursday uh, morning at 10:30 a.m. Uh, the next meeting uh, title is "Tired of Trying to Get More Faith and Finding the Will of God." It's a question. Uh, and I think we've all been there at least a time or two. And then a reminder to check out and subscribe to Facebook where Leah posts, Pastor Leah posts a, a daily devotion. Uh, please like it and please share it. And then uh, I think, I think that's it. What's the next slide? That's it. We're good to go. All right. So let's get ready to praise the Lord. Worship team, let's go.
bless the Lord. Woo. Well, go ahead and give him some praise right where you are. <laughs> Y'all didn't hear what we just heard. Can I hear you louder in the back? Yeah. Somebody say, whoop, whoop. <laughs> Good to be here.
is he not? And you know, the song segues right into what I'm going to be talking about because even when we don't feel it and we don't see it, if we just trust in him, he will make a way. I'm going to uh, just ask those that are here, since there's so few of us, uh, for offering, uh, just place your uh, tithes and offering in the plate at the end of the service. And uh, those who are watching online, you can give through our website. Uh, through PayPal, but um, thank you, praise team. So the title of today's message is Choose You This Day. Today I want to talk to you about one of the most famous men in the Bible, Joshua. I'm sure all of us have studied the life of Joshua at some point, and maybe even multiple times, especially those who are raised in church. I mean, all of us know the story of Joshua. But I want us to really focus on a passage of Scripture that we all know or have heard multiple times in our walk with the Lord. It is so common that many have probably never taken the time to honestly think about its implications. After Joshua led the children of Israel out of the wilderness and conquered the promised land, he gathered all of Israel before him and gave a farewell address to the nation. Much like an outgoing president gives a farewell address, he did the same thing. In the last verse of his address, he asks a rhetorical question that the Holy Spirit asks each and every soul that has, is, or will live until all things are fulfilled. He asks, choose you this day whom you will serve. And let's look at this passage of Scripture in Joshua 24, 1 through 15. So it says, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and their, for their judges and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. Whoa, don't go too fast. And Joshua said, no, you're good. Go to the next verse. Molly's helping out with the uh, slides. She's doing a great job. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it, but Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. And as you recall, they went into Egypt because of the famine. And I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them, and afterward I brought you out. And I brought you, your fathers, out of Egypt, and ye came unto the sea, and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen under the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea upon them, and covered them, and your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt, and ye dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan, and they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand that ye might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel, and sent and called Balaam the son of Beor to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam, therefore he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. And we're going to speak about Balaam here in a little bit. And you went in over Jordan and came unto Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I delivered them under your hand. There's a lot of ites in there. And I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, even to the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword nor with thy bow. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you did, uh, which ye built not, and ye dwell in them. Of the vineyards and olivers which ye planted not, do you eat? 
Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And then our key verse, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that is a, a very powerful scripture. And if we really think about it, it seems like such an obvious question that any Christian would hardly assent to. Sure, we're going to serve the Lord. That's what Christians do. Much like the children of Israel did when Joshua asked it of them, they heartily accepted. If you go on to read that chapter, they're like, of course we're going to serve the Lord. We'll never go back to the gods of the Egyptians and the Amorites. But they did. But do we really think about what God is asking us with this one simple question? There are essentially three choices rolled up into the one main choice. They are, one, who are you going to choose, God or self? Two, what are you going to choose to believe, God or your circumstances? And then three, will you try to serve two masters, meaning are you going to try and serve self and or circumstances and God? So let's look at our first point, God or self. Let's take a closer look at this first question. Are you going, or are you and I going to choose to serve ourselves, or are we going to serve the Lord? Joshua had to make the same choice just like you and me. We don't know much about the life of Joshua prior to Exodus, but we do know that he was born a slave in Egypt and left with the children of Israel when Moses led them out of Egypt. He would have seen all the mighty plagues that the Lord brought against Pharaoh. He would have watched Moses uh, turn the water to blood, cursed the land with frogs, smote the people with boils, and all the other plagues that God laid against the Egyptians. He walked through a divided Red Sea on dry ground and watched as Pharaoh and his armies perished in the waters as God let the waters flow back together. He went on to become Moses' right-hand man. He was one of the twelve spies that searched out the land of Canaan to bring a report back to Moses. He was highly respected by Moses and even became a kind of attendant to Moses. And all this he had a choice to make. He had to choose to serve Moses as unto the Lord, or he could choose to serve Moses as unto himself. Just as in today's world, a position of authority can be manipulated for personal gain. Is that not the truth? Can I get an amen on people in power manipulating their positions for personal gain? We see it every day on television. And Joshua would have been no different. I'm sure it wasn't much different for him. He had to make the same choice. Many times we can be doing the right thing for the wrong reason. A prime example of this would be Judas. Judas walked with Jesus, was counted among the twelve, yet in his heart his motives were always selfish. Outwardly he had the appearance of holiness, but on the inside he was rotten. Let's look at John 12, 3 through 6 to illustrate this. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of uh, spike, spikenard, very costly, and appointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? So he's trying to act all holy. Let's, let's give this money to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. So Judas was like the treasurer, and don't think anything wrong of me since I'm the treasurer of the church. I'm not a Judas, but, but Judas, Judas was the treasurer for Jesus' ministry, and he was probably skimming off the top, because that says right there he didn't care anything for the poor. He only wanted it, the money so he could be in his, in his power, and that's why he eventually sold Jesus out uh, for 30 pieces of silver. Judas chose to serve self despite what it looked like on the outside. Another prime example, and specifically mentioned in today's passage, is Balaam. And a lot of people might try and say that Balaam uh, was just a soothsayer, but he had to have been right with the Lord at some point because he knew the, war, the, Lord, the Lord's voice. He wasn't, he wasn't just out there and all of a sudden like something's talking. He's like, oh, who is this? No, he's, the Lord spoke to him. But somewhere along the way, he let his own personal selfish desires start to skew his prophetic ministry. And as such, when the king of Moab came and uh, ba Balak came and uh, wanted him to curse the Israelites, 
he was like, well, let me first go see what the Lord has to say. And he had to stop and pray and ask the Lord. And the Lord said, no, you're not to curse them. Uh, you're going to have to tell the king of Balak, no. And so he told him, okay, no, the Lord says no, go back. And then, of course, they sent more envoys to him. And finally, he's like, well, let me ask the Lord again, like he didn't already know. And then the Lord spoke to him again and said, basically, if you want to go, it's at your own risk. And so he's like, well, okay, I'll go. And uh, that reminds me of a, a funny story. How many uh, men here who were married or been, in, uh, been married when your wife says, well, you just do what you want to do? <laughs> Does that ever work out well <laughs> for any of the men? <laughs> that, that, that never works out well. It's, that's always like, if you do that, you're going to pay the consequences. Uh, but we're like, oh, well, she said I could go do that. Well, that's what I want to do. I'm going to go do it. <laughs> and then we find ourselves much like Balaam, who was on his donkey going to with Balak and the princes to curse the Israelites. And then uh, there was an angel in the road ready to kill him, smite him dead. And the donkey kept running off into the ditch, as <laughs> Shannon alluded to this morning uh, before uh, service. And uh, finally, he finally said, oh, well, okay, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. But still he went with them. He still chose to go and take the money that uh, Balak gave him. And it's funny because he got all the way to viewing the entire uh, armies of the Israelites, the entire encampment. He was ready to pronounce judgment. And the Lord spoke to him. And Balak actually said some of the, most prof some of the best words that we can stand on prophetically because he said god is not a man that he should lie nor the son of man that he should repent and what god has said he will accomplish and but the sad thing about balaam is even though he knew right he knew what the lord had said he still chose to serve self and does anybody actually know what happened to balaam i never knew it until just when i was studying for this he was actually killed in one of the battles when the israelites were taking the land when they smote uh, part of moab he was among them. He went to visit somebody, some friends there. He was in the. He went where he wasn't supposed to go, and he he caught it. Cost him his life, living for selfish gain. James tells us uh, how this process will unfold and what its ultimate outcome will be. That is living unto self. Let's look at James one thirteen through fifteen. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So the end result of choosing to serve self over God is exactly that, death. Both Balaam and Judas' life followed that same exact course. Both of their lives ended in their deaths, premature deaths. Judas ended up hanging himself. Balaam ended up being in the, in, the, in the way of God's people moving, and it was slaughtered. Both lusted after money and power, which led them down a path they never intended to walk down, ultimately culminating in their deaths. The reality is that none of us are any different than Judas or Balaam. All of us can be led away if we are not careful. Joshua would have been no different either. He would have undergone the same temptations they did, and likewise, all of us are. All of us do go and uh, undergo those same temptations. Once Joshua was given the leadership of the nation, Satan would, most, uh, would have most definitely tried to tempt him to be self-serving. As, and even as tempting his position was next to Moses, once he's been given full control, you know that Satan was there just trying to derail him at every turn, whether it was through you know, outside uh, circumstances or whether it was from internal uh, trying to lift him up in pride you name it, anything that we go through, he had to have it you know, times 10 when he was leading the nation. Satan even succeeded in deceiving Joshua to rely on his own wisdom when the Gibeonites came in pretending that they were from a long way off when in fact they were only 15 miles down the road. And if you don't remember the Gibeonites, they were um, just 15 miles from Jericho. And when they saw how the Israelites threw down Jericho and they eventually overcame Ai, they... Um, they were like, oh, snap, this is, uh, this is serious. <laughs> so, that, which, you got to give them credit. They were like, uh, instead of fighting because we're probably going to lose, let's try and uh, work a deal out here. And so they lied, and they said they came from a long way. They wore you know, ratty clothes that were all 
uh, worn out and they brought moldy bread with them and they're like, see, look, we've been journeying for so long. And, it, when they, and Joshua was like, okay, well, they're a long way off. We'll go ahead and make peace with them. Even though the Lord specifically told them not to make peace with anybody in the land. And so he made peace. Then he finds out, oh, they're just down the street, basically. And um, then he pronounced judgment on them. But what's interesting uh, about the Gibeonites is that um, Joshua, when he judged them, he said they have to bear water for the congregation, meaning for the tabernacle. They would have to constantly supply uh, the tabernacle and eventually the temple with water and, and supplies. And that was their servitude. And they actually continued to do that all the way through um, the entire nation's history. That was like they settled into it and even um, David uh, organized them into their own little um, you know, kind of priestly class almost to help, uh, help serve the temple. So even in, even in deceit, when their uh, aims were evil, God has a way of redeeming even a bad situation such as that. Uh, Joshua realized this mistake and quickly turned back to the Lord, but it shows just how quickly we can, go, uh, can give way to self if we aren't careful. We have to choose the Lord over every selfish desire and thought, no matter what, even if those th thoughts aren't necessarily sinful. That's what Jesus told us in Matthew 16, 24. If any man will come unto me, come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Deny yourself and Take up the cross of Christ and follow him, because to serve self will lead to nothing but heartache and eventually death. Choose you this day whom you will serve. That brings us to our second point, God or circumstances. I would venture to say that the problem for most Christians today isn't so much of serving themselves instead of God, but rather succumbing to believing in our circumstances more than we believe in God. Can I get an amen? Amen. Yes. And all of us have been there because there is nothing more subtle than to give in to your circumstances. Because they are right there in front of you. They are physically, they're tangible. You can touch them. You can see them. For me, they literally were physical. Exactly. When faced with what looks like overwhelming difficulty, it is, it is very tempting to give up or give in to whatever the problem is that we face. You see, when we choose to serve the Lord... We are choosing to believe him, and if we are going to believe him on one matter, then we need to believe him in all matters. The biggest problem that the children of Israel had was that they could not get their eyes off of their circumstances. They constantly looked around them and focused on their problems rather than focusing on what God had promised them. I know I'm not the only one who has struggled with this from time to time. A uh, prime example in my own life came when uh, just work was stressful and you know clients were deserting us, and I had a... I had a long time client, you know, not use me and go with another agent. And I was ready to just throw in the towel and, you know, quit the business and go do something else. And I even called uh, a, a person I know who works for a similar industry. And I got all the details and the numbers to call for working, uh, working for him. And all that was in my own wisdom. I thought if I just do that, I'll be happy and I'll be good and go lucky. But I knew in my spirit that was not what the Lord wanted. He was putting a check there and saying, no, get a hold of your feelings. Are you going to trust your feelings? Or are you going to trust me? And thankfully, I listened to the Lord in spite of myself, even though I didn't want to. And that was the key. I, I wanted to give in to those feelings. I wanted to do what I thought was best. But you can't do that. You have to continually trust the Lord. And it turned out for the best. I mean, if I had done that, it would have been, it would have been terrible. It is easy to do when the problem is real and looms large in front of you. One of the most glaring examples of this in Joshua's life, though he didn't succumb to the temptation, was when he accompanied Caleb and the other ten spies on their mission to spy out the land. They spent 40 days scouting out their enemies and the natural resources of the land. The other ten spies said that it truly was, as the Lord had spoken, that it was a land flowing with milk and honey. However, they said that there were too many giants in the land and that the people were too strong to be overthrown. Despite that, what the Lord had told them was true, they could only see the obstacles in their way. Notice that when the Bible calls it, uh, the Bible calls it an evil report, not a false report. Has anybody ever thought about that? In Numbers, uh, it's in Numbers chapter 13 specifically, 
But the Lord says they brought an evil report, and there's been theologians say, oh, well, it, they lied about the giants being so, you know, they lied about the people's stature and all that. But it doesn't say that. It does not say that they lied. They actually said the truth. Notice they used facts to prove, to try and sell a bigger lie. They used the facts that there was a, they were giants and they were cannibalistic. They says they consumed, they were people who consumed the land. And yet, all that being true, they gave an evil report because they looked at the circumstances, they saw the giants in the land, and they said it can't be done. Rather than looking like Joshua and Caleb saw, uh, and they, they said, no, the Lord has promised the land, we will take the land. Joshua and Caleb saw the same giants, the same inhabitants that devoured land, but what they saw that the others didn't was that was the promise that God made them. They chose to believe God over their circumstances. They were fully persuaded that no matter how many giants stood in their way, no matter how many walled cities needed to be overthrown, the land was theirs to inhabit. God made a decree, and he would not reverse it. The spies caused the people to doubt God, and they were whipped into a frenzy to revolt. Instead of seeing how God had made a way and provided in each and every situation, all they could see were their their seemingly insurmountable circumstances that stood in the way of claiming what the Lord had promised. So they were forced to wander through the desert for an additional 40 years, all because they wouldn't choose to believe what the Lord had promised. That journey should have taken no more than six to eight weeks. It's just not that far. And yet it took them 40 years. And a whole generation had to pass away because of unbelief. Unbelief will always lead to ruin. And if it doesn't lead to your exact ruin right there in that moment, it will drag out the desert period longer than it needed to be. Because all of us will face those desert periods. All of us will face circumstances that seem insurmountable, that seem like they can't be overcome. But if we put our faith in Christ and what he did for us, if we trust that the Lord is going to see us through, the desert period will actually be shorter. A prime example in my life was I, when I was single, I relied on my own thinking to try and find a wife. I said, I know how to do it. I'll do this and I'll do that. And I signed up for ChristianMingle.com and I signed up for Match.com. And I'm like, I'm going to different youth groups to try and meet Christian women. And you know what it got me? It got me like five dates total in eight years. <laughs> it, was, it was like the Lord was throwing a roadblock in front of me every single way. And I thought, well, what am I doomed to be single? I wasn't thinking because I was looking at it from a self-perspective. I kept looking at my circumstances and saying, oh, woe is me. And finally, when the Lord finally got a hold of me, and I said, you know what? I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm going to trust you, even if I, I don't care if I am single for the rest of my life, I'm going to trust you to find me, the wife that you want for me. And not a month later, Jennifer walks in my life. And that's a whole other story for another day. But the Lord... The Lord, as soon as I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you, the wilderness period went from an eight-year period down to a month, 30 days. That was it. All because I finally settled it in my heart to trust the Lord. Joshua, through all of this, kept his eyes on the promise. Notice Joshua and Caleb were the only two from that generation, not even Moses, that were able to uh, make it into the promised land. Circumstances will always change and go from good to bad and from bad to worse and back again to good, but God never changes and his promise to see us through to the day of Christ Jesus is an everlasting promise. Our biggest mistake as believers is focusing on what the problem is when we should be focusing on who can solve the problem. There is no giant that can stand against God and his promises. We need to be fully persuaded in our hearts, just as Joshua and Caleb were, that no matter what stands in our way, that if it exalts itself against God and his word, then it cannot stand. I don't care if the giant is cancer and they say you only have six weeks to live. I don't care if you have a bill due and you got zero money in the bank account. I don't care whatever it might be. Whatever giant stands in your way and like Goliath rails against the people of God, you know you can be like David and say, no, the Lord says that he has delivered you into my hand today. It doesn't matter if it's sickness, poverty, relationship problems, whatever it is, God has overcome. And just in this last few weeks, we had COVID strike our church. 
and a couple members got sick with it. And I remember the Sunday night after I found out that John got sick with it, I had this weird headache that started in my head. And it was different from anything, you know, wasn't a normal like caffeine headache or something like that. It was just, it was just there, this kind of dull throbbing in my head. And I went to bed and I thought, ah, I'll be better in the morning. And in the morning it was still there. And it was just kind of just dull ache all day Monday. And I, and I had this temptation to run to the computer and type in COVID symptoms and see if a headache was one of them. And I had this temptation to, to just give in, lay down and say, well, I guess I'm just getting it. And I said, no. I said, I do not have to accept this. I do not have to accept these symptoms. I do not have to accept this virus in my body. And I prayed against it all day. I fought against it all day. I went and took communion several times to remind myself of what Christ did for me at the cross. And by the end of Monday night, it was gone. And then Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, Tuesday morning, interestingly enough, one of our clients who um, she and her husband have had it for a while now, um, hopefully they're doing better. I haven't heard, but uh, she said that the big, biggest symptom she had was that she had what felt like a sinus headache for days on end. And then right there, the devil said, "Oh, see, you got it," and he started trying to bring the headache back on. And I had to there again fight against it and say, "No, I'm not going to accept this in my body." And it went away. And on Wednesday, he tried the same thing, and it went away. And I kept standing on what the Lord had said, that by his stripes I am healed. He conquered sin at the cross, and the fruit of sin is sickness, so he conquered sickness at the cross as well. Choose, you, uh, choose this day to believe God over every evil report that the enemy might throw against you. Paul got it just like Joshua did. That's why Paul could write with such passion in Romans 8, 35-39. And I'm going to read this uh, fairly quickly, so just keep it going in the background. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And how is the love of God manifested in Christ Jesus? He came that we may have life and life more abundantly. When the devil raises up a giant to assail you, proclaim in victory that God loves you, and in Christ Jesus there is no weapon formed against you that can prosper. God never promised that there wouldn't be giants to slay, but he did promise that if we trust him completely with our very lives, that every giant will be put down in Christ Jesus our Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And that brings us to our third point. Are we going to try and serve God and ourselves or give in to circumstances while professing to claim in God? No believer sets out to serve two masters, but many times we find ourselves doing just that. We may not think we are, but when we let selfish desires pollute our walk with God or our circumstances define our faith, we are in fact serving two masters. We pay lip service to God while in our hearts we are double-minded, constantly giving place to vain imaginations and giving place to fear because the valley we're going through seems too d deep and dark to make it through. Pastor Jeff has been teaching on this very thing for several weeks now. Paul says in Romans 8, 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Too often we think being carnally minded is thinking or acting in overtly sinful ways. The three church of God sins, drinking, smoking, cussing. That's it. If you did those, you're, you're being carnal. That's what we were raised in. And Audrey knows because she, she grew up in that. <laughs> no shorts, that's right. Shorts, swimming with the, the opposite sex, and drinking, smoking, cussing. That's it. You don't do those things, you'll make it. And it's ridiculous, but that's not really that far from the truth on how, how we were raised. Not from mom and dad, but just the, the church in general. But that's only a portion of what it means to be carnally minded. Any thought or action that is contrary to God's word is carnality. Meaning if you rely on your own wisdom instead of asking God for his wisdom in a situation, you are being carnally minded. If you give more weight to what doctors say than to what the Bible says, you are being carnally minded. 
If you think that your good deeds or good habits will merit you favor with God, you are being carnally minded. We need to purge our hearts and minds of any thoughts or desires that exalt themselves above God. That's why Paul declared, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. We need to ask ourselves, what do I truly believe? Will I believe God even when my circumstances say otherwise? Will I believe God for something he promised me even when there are giants inhabiting the promised land? Will I believe God even when it will cost me something? Will I believe God when being selfish is easier or more advantageous in the short term? There is only one, uh, there's only room for one king on your heart's throne. Jesus said in Luke 16, 13, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. And you can replace mammon with anything. That word, you can replace it with anything. You can't serve God and yourself. You can't serve God and your feelings. You can't serve God and your circumstances. You can't serve God and just fill in the blank with whatever it is. You cannot uh, do that. There is only room for one king on the throne of your heart, and if Jesus isn't sitting on it, you will reap nothing but destruction in this life and the next. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Shannon, come on up to the piano. This is a short one today. I left all the math out and made it shorter. In conclusion, Joshua was only a man. He wasn't perfect. He stumbled sometimes just like the rest of us, yet he accomplished amazing things for God because he was fully persuaded in his heart that the only choice in life that mattered was to follow God. We need to be like Joshua and say, to, and say today, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Don't let selfish desires derail your relationship with God. Don't let your circumstances dictate what you believe. Let your faith dictate to your circumstances what God says. God is loving and so merciful that he understands exactly what each and every one of us is going through. He knows that there are temporal needs that we have to have to survive. The key is not to serve God only to have him solve our problems, but to serve God because he is worthy of our worship and love. By serving him in that manner, he will provide everything that we have need of here on earth. Jesus said in Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All these things means just that. All these things. We get so focused on our needs, and we treat God like a genie. We just rub the lamp. Lord, I need this. When if we would just focus on him, he'll actually provide. It's completely opposite of what we, what we think in the natural. Because we think in the natural, well, we got we to gotta do this, and we got to do that to get something. Yeah. And God just says, hey, if you just focus on me, if you seek me first, guess what? Those things will follow you. Yeah. Not even that. They'll actually chase you down. You'll fall into opportunities. You'll fall into blessings that... You never even thought were possible. Like a uh, prime example was mom, Pastor Leah, when she needed a job. She said, Lord, I need a job. She had a, a list of things that she wanted out of the job. Uh, it was like five different things. And she prayed and said, Lord, you lead me to the job that will meet, meet this criteria. And it led her to selling prepaid funeral lots. And she sold zero in like six or eight months. She didn't make a dime. And she was driving back and forth to Roswell every day, not making any money. And she thought, Lord, because that's what, that's what the Lord told her to do. And she, the Lord even confirmed it with uh, Pastor Bruce Weeks. He was like, this is going to sound crazy, but the Lord said, you need to go work at Roswell Funeral Home selling funeral plots, prepaid funeral plots. And she was like, okay. And she didn't understand why she was there. But in that process, she had to get an insurance license because prepaid funeral lots are a type of life insurance. And so I remember when it was when Riverstone had first opened up and we all went out there as a family to the Mexican restaurant that was there. And there was an insurance agency. And dad said, you need to go in here and ask for a job. He's just like, you need to do this. 
He just felt in his spirit, this is where you need to go. And they got into the biggest argument because she was like, if they needed help, they'll have a help wanted sign. He said, those people don't put help wanted signs up. He's like, and so she was like, well, fine. I'm just going to go in there just to spite him, just to prove that they didn't need a help. They didn't need to hire her. And she got hired that day. <laughs> and that changed the course of all of our lives. Because she was faithful to God and, and trusting him to lead her to the job she, that uh, she needed. And um, she's given that, um, that account uh, later on where she was driving out to Cartersville for something. And the Lord just, he just put it all in her spirit. I gave you accounts that you didn't, uh, that you didn't get yourself. I gave you this that you didn't get yourself. All these things just like the children of Israel. Gave them houses they didn't build, vineyards they didn't plant. He gave them cities they didn't, uh, they, you know, that they didn't build. He gave it all to them just because they were faithful to follow him. In conclusion, will you choose God or self? Will you believe your circumstances more than God? Are you going to continue being double-minded trying to serve two masters? Choose to be fully persuaded in your heart to follow God. Choose today to serve God and he will drive the giants from the land. Now, I know it's been, it's been short, but if there's, if there's anybody struggling with giants right now in their, in their promised land, I'm just going to extend an altar call. If anybody wants to come up for prayer, we'll gladly pray with you. If anybody out there um, on, uh, online, if, if there's a giant that's occupying your promised land, you can join with us in prayer. Yeah. 